If you would, open up your Bibles to Romans chapter 13. That's where we're going to be beginning with our lesson for this morning. In Romans, the 13th chapter, as Paul has just finished describing how they, the congregation there at Rome, and we, everyone as Christians, everyone who is in the body of Christ, ought to be in submission to the governing authorities, and then that we are to fulfill the law through love, that we love each other as ourselves. He says, starting down in verse 12, The night is far gone. The day is at hand. So then, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly, as in the daytime, not in orgies and drunkenness, not in sexual immorality and sensuality, not in quarreling and jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Now there's a lot of points that we could make. There's a lot of things that we can extrapolate from this passage here. One of the most obvious ones is that even though a person becomes a Christian, even though they put on Christ in baptism and say they're going to follow Him and dedicate their life to that, does not mean that they are a perfect person. It doesn't mean that they are immune to temptation. Otherwise, Paul would be wasting his breath here. He wouldn't be doing any good to write these words down, words that are clearly inspired, given to him by the Holy Spirit. He's telling them that if you are Christians, to act like it. He says, cast off the works of darkness, put on the armor of light. You're expected to live up to that standard. It's one of the things when Brother Daniel Rube was here a little while ago that he talked about, about having that name and the value of having a good name. And if we're to wear the name of Christian, then we're to act like it. If we're to be in the household of God, there are certain expectations, certain responsibilities that come with being His children and being heirs of the promises. But beyond that, I want to dissect this a little bit, and specifically one word that is found there in verse 13 and the English Standard uh, Translation puts it as sensuality, and so do most of the other modern translations. But the King James and others translate this as lasciviousness. And we're going to get into, in a, in a little bit, some of the definition of, of what the term really means. In fact, that's going to be the first thing we, we point out. But you notice here, right off the bat, what we look at here, as he's defining this as one of the things that they're not to be involved in anymore. One of the things that they might have been doing, that they might have had in their life for some stretch of time, but he says, you know, you're to not have anything to do with that. You're to cast that off. You're to walk properly. So at the very least, one thing we can say about lasciviousness, sensuality, it's also translated in other places as licentiousness or lewdness, is that it's not walking properly. It's not proper behavior. It's not what is right. It is not what is expected of one who is a Christian. But as we go further into that, let's just spend some time talking about the, the definition of the term. The Greek word that we find translated into these various terms in the English is aselgia, uh, which is uh, in Thayer's Greek lexicon uh, defined as unbridled lusts, licentiousness, shameless. It's wanton acts or manners such as filthy words, indecent bodily movements, unchaste handling of males and females. So this goes both ways. It's not on one gender or the other. This is a term that applies across the board towards the expression of lust in such a way that is unbecoming, that is shameless. And we don't use words like wanton very much anymore, but we understand the connotation there, that it's filthy, it is indecent. Again, what we read there in Romans chapter 13, if we're to walk properly, then we're not to have any part of this. So it all goes back to the same Greek word, and that's what we're looking at here, this lasciviousness, licentiousness, this lewdness is what we're talking about, and you notice when we talk about all this, one of the things that comes into your mind is probably fornication. But you notice there where we read already in Romans 13 that 
both words are being used, and we find the same thing over in Galatians chapter 5. In Galatians chapter 5, as many of us are well familiar with, starting with verse 19, it lists the works of the flesh. It says, Now the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. So we see very clearly there, if it's listed in this list, then we're not to have anything to do with it. It says very clearly that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Listed right alongside of idolatry, jealousy, rivalries, drunkenness, envy. It's all the same thing in that regard, but it all leads to the same conclusion, but they're not one and the same. Just as we read in Romans 13, and just as we read here, that it says, the modern translations say sexual immorality, the older ones say fornication, and then it says sensuality or lasciviousness, they are not the same thing. We might think that, well, it's just repeating itself for emphasis. No, it's not. They're not the same thing. A lot of times we would like to, to group things together like that. We use fornication and sexual immorality as the umbrella term, and a lot of things fall under that. Of adultery, bestiality, any number of things fall under that umbrella term of fornication. But lasciviousness and sensuality is not one of them. So everything we're talking about this morning, about that, that indecent bodily moon and that unchaste handling, you think, well, as long as I don't commit fornication, as long as I'm you know, not being sexually immoral, then I'm okay. No, because they are not the same thing. There's a very clear, there's a very distinct difference in what we see. And really, when we talk about the definition of the term and what it means and how we would understand it and how we would recognize it, well, how do I know where that line is, is drawn and what exactly makes something sensuality, what makes something lasciviousness versus, versus not, is that when we talk about what it means, it's that indecent bodily, it's a disregard for decency. It's getting to a point where you don't care what people will think when they see you doing these things or when they hear about it. It's getting into that state of mind as it says they're unbridled lust, the point to where the lust has more or less taken over. And so it should sound pretty familiar to what we were talking about on Wednesday night with Herod when Herodias' daughter came in and danced. We talked about how crazy it is for him to make her an offer like that to swear to her, to make a vow that anything she would ask of him up to half of his kingdom, he would give to her. Now, no king, as we said, in his right mind would make such a promise. He wouldn't make an offer like that. Give up your power, give up your, your wealth. So why would he do that? Because he wasn't thinking clear. Because the lust had taken over. And that's what we're talking about here. Over in Ephesians chapter 4. In Ephesians chapter 4, there, starting with verse 17, it says, Now this I say and testify in the Lord, that you must no longer walk as the Gentiles do in the futility of their minds. They are darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their hardness of heart. They have become callous and have given themselves up to sensuality, greedy to practice every kind of impurity. Now, Paul is pointing out here the Gentiles, those who have not heard the gospel, and he talks about their, their ignorance. And a lot of times we try to excuse people in such a state, well, they don't know any better. Then again, of course, the Bible says that God once overlooked times of ignorance, but of course now he's calling everyone everywhere to repent. So ignorance is, first of all, no longer an excuse for us. But you notice what he says here. He says, they've given themselves up, given themselves completely over to sensuality, to lasciviousness, and what it says there in verse 19, they have become callous. They just don't feel it anymore. We might describe this in terms, a lot of preachers, a lot of people already have, is losing the ability to blush, that it would no longer affect us. That we're so caught up in it, caught up in the moment, that we don't care what people would see or what they would say or the things that they would think about us 
when we live our lives in such a manner. And that's what we're getting at here. And that, that's not to say that this happens in every single instance. Hopefully it wouldn't. Hopefully if someone who is a Christian were to be engaged in such an act, afterward they would say, I can't believe I acted like that. Afterward they would have shame and they would repent of it. I just point this out to say that it can lead to this point. That if one continues to practice this lasciviousness, where they are caught up in these unbridled lusts, that they have a disregard for decency once, they do it again and again, and eventually it doesn't matter to them. Eventually they become callous. They become unfeeling to it. And so they have no shame when it comes to that. But as we talk about what it means to see someone being lascivious or to be lewd, to be indecent in such a manner, we have to understand what we're talking about here. Again, we're talking about, well, how do I know it? How would I recognize it when I see it? And we really have to, to zero in on the problem here. We've already touched on it before. What we read in Romans tells us to walk properly, and then it says this is what we're not to do. So we know it's not proper. And as we read in Galatians that it's listed among the works of the flesh, we know this is something that would keep us from inheriting the kingdom of God. Now that alone tells us there's a serious problem here. And this is something we do not want in our lives. This is something that can cost someone their soul. But to get even more specific as to what we're talking about here, Jesus said himself is that this is one of the things that defiles that would make us impure, that would make us unclean. And perhaps that terminology is a little lost on us today. We don't use those, uh, those words too much anymore. But the idea of something being defiled, being unclean, it's filthy. You don't want to touch it. We understand the thought behind that. And there's certain images that come to mind that would represent this very well. And Whereas so many people would disregard or try to disregard things that the Bible says when it was penned by the apostles Paul and Peter and various others, a lot of people, when it's a direct quote from Jesus, at least that will make them sit up and pay attention. Well, here in Mark chapter 7, starting with verse 20, it says, And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. And for from within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, envy, slander, pride, foolishness. All these evil things come from within and they defile a person. So Jesus lists this along with theft, murder, and adultery. So again, it's lined up with pretty serious crimes, as we would regard them as the things that will defile us, that will make us dirty, that will make us unclean before God. And he says they come from within. As the scriptures talk about, we are tempted when we're drawn away by our own lusts, our own desires, when we let that get the better of us. So we can't blame someone else, not to say that those around us can't affect us and can't have an influence on us, because they do. But ultimately, we know we're given free will by God. We make our own choices, and we're going to have to be responsible for the consequences of those choices, of those actions. He says, these things come from within, and they are what defile. But yet we want to draw lines and say, well, theft, clearly, that's, that's wrong. And murder, obviously, is a terrible thing. Adultery, coveting, again, sexual immorality, fornication in general is listed. But besides that, we see lasciviousness, sensuality, being listed. What does that mean? Again, how can, we, how can we recognize that? And how is it that this defiles us? Jesus says it comes from within, but how do we, how do we know? Well, the problem with this lasciviousness, with this lewdness, with sensuality, is that it puts the emphasis on sexuality. It's saying that that's what's important. That's what you want. That's what you need. Emphasize that. If you have it, flaunt it. The idea in our society that sex sells. It's all, it's all the same thing. And it's putting it 
out there. It's putting it everywhere, oddly enough, except where it belongs. You look over in Hebrews, the 13th chapter. In Hebrews chapter 13, it says there, Let marriage be held in honor among all, and let the marriage bed be undefiled, for God will judge the sexually immoral and the adulterous. This verse, and there are several others from God's Word that tell us exactly what the sexual relationship is supposed to be, where those things are supposed to be contained. And it tells us that it's not to be defiled. And it tells us that God is going to judge anyone who would try to act outside of that and not have it in its proper place. And while, again, we emphasize the difference, what we're talking about this morning, lewdness, lasciviousness, that sensuality is not necessarily committing the act. It's not necessarily fornication itself. But it's putting the emphasis on that. It's saying it belongs out there in the world where everyone can see it, where everyone is participating, perhaps. That unchaste handling, that indecent bodily movement. Well, it's not like we've crossed a certain line. Perhaps not but it's still listed among the things that God disapproves of. And so to this end of, of looking at the problem and highlighting how we know where this is, how we can recognize it, the problem comes in that sensuality and lascivious, lasciviousness takes an awful lot of form. You talk about fornication, you talk about sexual immorality, it's pretty easy to define that. But when you talk about this term, and how it is condemned by the Scriptures, how we're told it is a work of the flesh that will keep us from inheriting the kingdom of God, you could be talking about pornography. Whether it's words, pictures, video, anything like that, that certainly falls under this term. It's that indecent handling, it's those shameless, wanton acts. There's no, there's no debate on this, I, I would think. I hope not. But that's very clearly lasciviousness. Pornography in its many forms. But you know, if that's all it was, then we could have just titled this lesson something to do with pornography and left it at that. But again, lasciviousness, that sensuality, covers a far broader spectrum. So it's not just pictures, it's not just videos, it's not just things like that. Lasciviousness also comes into play when you see sexually charged language and dialogue. And again, it's easy for us to point a finger and say, well, yeah, we see that going on in movies and in television and all kinds of things that we don't like and we try to avoid. But if we try to say that that's the only place where such things happen, we'd be fooling ourselves. What do we see in the workplace? What do we see out in our recreation time? Any time where there are men and women in close quarters spending time with one another, Naturally, people might be attracted to one another. And sadly, the conversation turns to innuendo. Turns to things that aren't right, that aren't proper. And it's saying things, or perhaps it's not saying things. It's what's not being said to get people thinking about that sensuality. Thinking about that. Again, it's the idea of putting the emphasis on that. Rather than the emphasis being on doing our job, on pleasing God, on being where we ought to be in life, being content with what we have. It's always highlighting how someone looks, or it's highlighting the way they move, or it's highlighting the clothing that they're wearing, which again leads us to another part of this, provocative dress. And again, you've probably heard a lot of sermons on modesty and on the clothes that we wear and the effect that they have. But Again, if that's all this lesson was, I would have titled it as such. But this idea of lasciviousness, of sensuality, that word that is clearly condemning God's word, clearly something that a Christian should have no part of, that's part of it as well. When someone dresses in a certain style, in a certain way, to catch the attention of others, to highlight those parts of their body, or they dress in a certain way where they know those garments are going to move and going to sway when they move, what is that if not lewdness? If not that putting the emphasis on sexuality, getting people to think about it, getting people to talk about 
And again, we can fool ourselves to say, well, yeah, that's what we see the, the high fashion models and the actors dressing. It's not just them. This is not an isolated issue. And it's not a new issue either. Something has been going on for a long, long time. It's because, as we say, it sells. People pay attention to it. We've noticed that it, it works. We also can talk about, when it comes to lasciviousness, sensuality, touching, dancing. A lot of young people, and let's be honest, it's not just young people, get involved with one another, do things they ought not. Now, maybe, like we say, they haven't crossed that line. Well, we, we, it's not like we've done this. Maybe not. But can you really say that what you've been involved in has been pure? It's been right? Has put you in the right mindset? Or have you been caught up in that moment? That the lust is taking over? And really, when we talk about dancing in this regard, that's what we're getting at with modern day dancing, is the movements, is the close contact between men and women who ought not to do so. It's not that dancing in and of itself is wrong. We see, again, in the scriptures, dancing as a form of celebration. But it wasn't a man and a woman holding each other close, making these kinds of movements that, if it weren't accompanied by music, would certainly raise a lot of eyebrows. That's what we're talking about here. So the problem with modern dancing, anytime you'd hear a sermon or read a, an article on dancing, this term is the root of it that sensuality, it's that lasciviousness. So to that end, I've heard the question, I think I've even asked the question on occasion, well, could a married couple dance? Well, if they're married, if they are in that covenant relationship with one another and they're clearly allowed to, to have that kind of sexual contact, I can't see why not. Certainly this is not as extreme, we would say, as as the act of sex itself, but that's not what we're talking about when we talk about modern day dancing most of the time, is it? It's young people, usually filled with hormones, and even if it's not young people, it's people who aren't married to one another, and they're thinking about what they're doing and perhaps thinking about where it might lead. All of this, again, falling under the heading of lasciviousness that lewdness, that sensuality, stirring up our minds, getting us to think about it, to talk about it. This special relationship that God clearly intended to only be for a husband and wife. And the thing we need to emphasize again is it doesn't matter the form that sensuality takes. Whether you're talking about pornography, whether you're talking about this, this improper touching or provocative dress or, or flirting and using that sexually charged dialogue, it doesn't matter if it's lasciviousness, if it's sensuality, like we've already read. It'll keep you from inheriting the kingdom of God. It will cost you your soul. So this thing that people are telling us is no big deal. It's no problem just to, to talk about it or think about it. As long as you don't act on it, as long as you don't cross that line, then you're okay. Or to just accept it and go with it because it's what people do. We need to be careful. If it's this lasciviousness, if we can look at it and say, what are we doing? Then it's one of the works of the flesh. It's what Jesus tells us defiles ourselves. It's what we're told God is going to judge, among several other things, on the last day. So no matter how much our society says, well, it's not like you're stealing anything. It's not like you're going out and murdering anybody. God puts it right in the same sentence. He puts it right alongside those things. He sees no distinction. He doesn't make any excuses. We need to be careful with ourselves, with our lives, with our bodies and our minds. So we've talked about the problem of what sensuality is, how it takes all these various forms, and it might affect one differently than another. For some people, pornography is a huge issue, and the addiction that it causes and the harm that comes from that is innumerable. Some people wouldn't think twice about that, but yet when it comes to 
provocative dress or it comes to kinds of touching and dancing. But no matter what form it takes, no matter how it affects us, there's no denying that there's a problem. It might be a problem for us personally, there's a problem for us culturally, as a society. It's a worldwide thing, like we said. It's not anything new. It's always been around. So let's talk about the solution. And the first thing that I feel like I should say and point out is rather blunt and difficult, but simple, all the same, and necessary. So we need to have self-control. We need to take control of ourselves. If we see in the very definition of the term that it's those unbridled lusts, if it's getting to that point where the lust is taking over and we don't care about decency, we don't care what people think of us, that we're no longer thinking clearly, then before we get to that point, we need to get a hold of ourselves. We need to make sure that we are thinking clearly and that we know what we're doing. Over in Titus chapter 2, verses 11 and 12 says, for the grace of God has appeared, bringing salvation for all people, training us to renounce ungodliness and worldly lusts and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age. You know, I didn't ask Andy to lead Amazing Grace, but it works out well that he did. The song that we sang. This grace has appeared, bringing salvation for all people. It is amazing. And we are saved by grace through faith, not by works. But when that grace came, this is what it does. It trains us. It teaches us to renounce ungodliness and worldly lusts, to get rid of that in our lives. It teaches us to be self-controlled, to be upright. Like we talked about at the beginning of the lesson, if you are a Christian, if you wear that name, then act like it. Live like it. You're going to be held to that standard if you say that you're a Christian. And we've, see, we've seen far too many examples of people who say that they're a Christian but don't live like it, and then the accusation of hypocrisy is leveled against all the church. There's too much of that already. We need to live self-controlled, upright lives. It's easier said than done. Yeah, that's difficult. It's a hard thing to do. But it's not impossible. God never asks us to do the impossible. And it's not all that complicated either. <coughs> Have self-control. Don't let those lusts, don't let those instincts, those impulses control you. It's pretty simple. But it is difficult. But it's what we need to do. is to take control and to leave those thoughts, leave those actions, the touching, all of that, leave it to where it belongs. Leave it to where God intended it to be. Over in 1 Corinthians chapter 7. In 1 Corinthians chapter 7, inspired by the Spirit, Paul is writing here, he says, Now concerning the matters about which you wrote, it is good... For a man not to have sexual relations with a woman. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. The husband should give to his wife her conjugal rights and likewise the wife to her husband. For the wife does not have authority over her own body, but the husband does. Likewise, the husband does not have authority over his own body, but the wife does. Do not deprive one another except perhaps by agreement for a limited time that you may devote yourselves to prayer, but then come together again so that Satan may not tempt you because of your lack of self-control. Now as a concession, not a command, I say this. I wish that all were as I myself am, but each has his own gift from God, one of one kind and one of another. To the unmarried and the widows, I say that it is good for them to remain single as I am. But if they cannot exercise self-control, they should marry for it is better to marry than to burn with passion. Paul's pretty clear. He's pretty blunt. If you are married, the sexual relationship is supposed to be part of that. You're not to get rid of that. You're not to diminish it. Recognize it for what it is. Don't deprive one another. 
And he says, if you're unmarried, it's better for you, in his opinion, to stay in that state. Because you have less complications in your life, less to worry about, especially at this time in the first century when they were under such extreme persecution. But he tells them, if you feel that you should marry, he says, you know, each has his own gift from God. Paul was unmarried his whole life. It clearly was not an issue for him. But he says, it's better for you to marry than to burn with passion. Now, with Paul advocating that being so in lust with someone is a good reason to get married, I don't see that from the text. I don't see how anyone could say that that's what he's getting at here. He's simply saying, that's where the sexual relationship, that's where all of this belongs. And to try to have it in any other way, to try to have it outside of the marriage relationship, is a sin, is wrong. And it is a very strong temptation, perhaps the strongest temptation for some people. He says, in that case, it's better to marry. That way you get rid of that in your life, or at the very least, you make it easier on yourself. And you notice how he talks about having self-control. We need to control ourselves. We need to understand this is where it belongs. This is what God created us for. The excuse that so many in the world make is, well, we have these impulses, we have these instincts, shouldn't we act on them? God gave us these bodies. God gave us those instincts for a reason, but He told us where they belong. And it's not up to us to go against that. We also understand Part of the solution here to the problem of sensuality, of licentiousness, is to just have nothing to do with it. To abstain from that. And not only to abstain, that's part of it, but that's not everything. To avoid it at all costs, as much as we can. Over in 2 Timothy chapter 2, starting in verse 20, he says, Now in a great house there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So flee youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. So not only are we to abstain from all the various forms that lasciviousness, that sensuality could take, the provocative dress, the improper touching, the handling, the movements, the pornography, all of it. We're not to have anything to do with it. He says, flee youthful lusts. That means run away in the opposite direction as far as you can, as fast as you can. Have nothing to do with it. If you know you're going to be in a certain place, a certain situation where that kind of dialogue is going to be going on. You're going to be hearing a lot of things that are going to put your mind in a place where it ought to be. Why go there? Why be there? Walk away from that conversation. If you know there's going to be people dressed in a certain way to catch the eye, to get the mind in that kind of thinking, why look at that? Why put yourself in that situation? Now again, we can't control what other people do. But as much as we can, we would be better off if we avoided it at all costs. If it'll keep us pure, if it'll keep us undefiled, that's something we need to think about. And most of all, we talk about the solution to the problem of sensuality, of lasciviousness, is we better not be taking it lightly. That's what the world does. Well, there's nothing wrong with dressing to, to catch someone's eye. There's nothing wrong with, with going to this dance and doing all these things. What's it making people think? Where is it putting their, their mindset? What's it putting the emphasis on? And why is it putting the emphasis there? And are the people in, involved in all this married to one another? Do they have any right to be thinking about one another, pursuing one another in such a regard? The world excuses it. Well, it's not like they're living together. It's not like they're doing all of these things. But as we've seen, the scriptures place this right alongside fornication, adultery, theft, murder. God doesn't take it lightly. He doesn't categorize sins as big or small. It's all the same to Him. 
we need to be taking the same stand. Sensuality is a danger to the soul, just as much as deceit or covetousness, any of the other things we could read about. We need to realize that, that there is a problem, but instead of focusing on the problem, we should focus on the solution. And again, we can't control what other people will do, but we can control what we do. We can not be a part of it. We can tell people what the Scriptures say about it. We can avoid it in our lives. Try to exercise self-control. Won't make it go away. It's never going to, not in this life. But it might keep us in the right relationship with God. It might be enough to where we make an impact on others to make them stop and think about what they're doing, what they're saying, why they're doing it. But that, the lesson is yours for this morning. The song of invitation we're about to sing says that Jesus is calling softly and tenderly. And it's kind of funny to think about the fact that he is. Because the call, the gospel call, for us to be saved, for us to have our sins forgiven, is one that is being made urgently. Because we need salvation. We need our sins to be gone. Because until they are, we're lost. Separated from God. And those who are separated from God in this life, will be separated from Him eternally in a fiery hell. You think that would be the kind of thing that you would shout as hard as you can everywhere. And God's Word is clear what we need to do. It doesn't mince words about it. But at the same time, as He invites us to come to Him, to be washed in His blood, to have our sins washed away, He does call soft, tender. He appeals to us. He leaves the choice up to us. He doesn't browbeat us. He doesn't condescend to us. He lets us know that we are guilty of sin. Tells us that we need to do something about it. But He doesn't force us. He just tells us what we need to do. And He offers freely forgiveness of sin. If you need that in your life this morning, if you have never been baptized into Christ, we have time and opportunity to do so. If you have read and believed God's Word, you know what the Bible says, repent of your sins. Be ready to confess Jesus as the Son of God and to be buried in water, immersed, to rise, to walk in newness of life, having those sins washed away. But maybe you've done so. Maybe you are a child of God this morning and there is sin in your life. But since calling upon His name, you have stumbled. You haven't been living as you should. But thankfully, we have time yet today to make that right. And we can pray with you, we can pray for you, whatever the case might be. But won't you please come have a seat on the front while we stand, while we sing.